Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we now have our presenters in conference. Participation in this presentation is by express written invitation of the AHA only. Unauthorized participants and or any party that aids and abets such unauthorized participants may be subject to criminal and civil penalties under both state and federal law. Please disconnect from the call or log off the webinar if the AHA does not expressly invite your participation. Please note that you may submit your questions and comments at any time using the chat pod located to the right-hand side of your webinar screen. You may also download a copy of today's slides from the resources pod located directly above the chat pod. It is now my pleasure to turn today's conference over to Aisha Long. Ma'am, you may begin. Thank you so much for joining the AHA's Section for Psychiatric and Substance Abuse Services and Physician Alliance. We're so excited today for a webinar featuring Prescribe Safe, and a community-based initiative in Monterey County. We're lucky to have Kevin Coffey, Vice President and Chief Development Officer at Montage Health, and Drs. Reb Close and Casey Grover, who launched the initiative. Thanks so much. Kevin? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming. It is truly an honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to share this information uh, throughout the country. And hopefully, this will be of help to all of you doing this uh, most important work throughout the country. Um, again, my name is Kevin Causey, and I run the Montage Health Foundation which has been uh, the funding uh, driver for uh, this program. And uh, very briefly, it is a uh, countywide initiative launched by the doctors I'll introduce here in a second. And it truly is a collective impact kind of approach to addressing this problem and uh, involves sectors from uh, throughout the county, law enforcement, uh, four different hospitals, healthcare organizations, Department of uh, Health, uh, and others. And uh, it is my true honor and pleasure to introduce uh, doctors Casey Grover and Reb Close. Uh, they are both emergency room doctors here at the Community Hospital of Monterey Peninsula and are the driving force behind this program and indeed the, the brain children, if you were, about this program. And so I will let them walk you through uh, the nuts and bolts of this. And uh, again, please don't hesitate to uh, post up questions, uh, which we'll get to at the end of the presentation. So with that, Drs. Close and Grover, I turn it over to you. Thank you so much for having us. It's an honor to be able to chat with everyone today. And just as we have androgynous names, Reb is the female voice, and I, Casey, am the male voice, um, we're very honored to get to be here today and present the fine work that Collaboration has built for us in Monterey County. Um, just briefly, um, <clears throat> it's funny, a few days ago, uh, Reb and I were reflecting upon our start with Prescribed Safe in 2013, and we were honestly presenting to, you know, meetings of five or ten people and really small groups, and we've been really so honored to receive such incredible support. And this is a list of where we presented in the past, uh, in the past year, and yes, that does include the White House. Uh, and the Vatican. Uh, we've had a number of uh, big honors for our organization. Uh, and we were talking about prior to this webinar starting that simply the goal here is just to save lives, meaning we just want to help people with problems with pain get treatment for pain. We want to prevent overdoses and we want to treat addiction with present sorry addiction when present. Um, this briefly is a photo from when we visited the White House in 2018. This is outside the West Wing with one of our psychiatrists from our hospital, Dr. Cindy Hunt. And then we were also honored to receive the Chapter Service Award from the California Chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians for statewide work led by Dr. Close in 2018. I don't know if you want to make a comment about that. No, it's been a great collaboration and since so many groups are interested in what they can do to help and everyone is in some way impacted by it, our work is very much appreciated and people build upon it and it's been an absolute honor to be able to share what we do and use the ideas from others to move things forward. This was also one of our local congressmen who has been extremely supportive of our work and I think hopefully the take-home point that we will drive home as a part of this presentation and you're starting to see it, that it takes a village. Mm -hmm. And truly, Monterey County Village has rallied along with us and our hospital and our organization 
uh, to move forward with safety for our community that hopefully can spread elsewhere. So we'll start <clears throat> with a painting. And this is uh, a painting by a patient and friend of mine named Paul. Uh, Paul is an opiate addict. He's been in and out of recovery. He's really struggled. And this is his painting of what it's like to live with addiction. And I think this is what right now sometimes people forget, is that addiction involves so much suffering. And people start with pain pills for legitimate reasons, um, an injury, a dental extraction, a planned surgery, and they end up in a really bad place. And it's not necessarily their fault. And I think we're going to present, hopefully, some compelling ways to try to prevent people getting to where Paul is. And hopefully, as you can see in this painting, prevent the emotional angst and pain that Paul has suffered through living with addiction. So a little bit of framework as to how we got started. In 2013, right around the time we got started with Prescribed Safe, the numbers would suggest that 2.3% of Americans were actively misusing their prescription drugs, with a lifetime incidence of misusing their prescription drugs of 16%. And I don't know about you, but I'm not great with math. Dr. Close is actually pretty good with math, <laughs> but I'm not. And I like football. So we're going to apply those numbers to the next Green Bay Packers home football game, OK? And so at the next football game at Lambeau Field, which seats 80,735 people, there will be, based on those numbers, 1,700 people at that game currently misusing their prescription medications and almost 12,000 people at the game that will misuse their prescription drugs at least once in their lifetime. And when you zoom out and you look at a picture of the whole field in the stadium, you just think, wow, they're there. They're in that photo. They are in the stands. They're so present and prevalent. And um, it's very unfortunate. Uh, overdoses are, are common, as we will speak of, that somewhere between probably three and five people will die in America from overdose of the course of this one-hour webinar. And you can really start to see how it really affects so many people in our communities and in our country. Unfortunately, a lot of how this started and continues to start is with the medicine cabinet. So this is an older article from uh, the Associated Press that talks about teens rating medicine cabinets. For example, let's say I end up having to have ankle surgery next week and I come home with some pain pills. If I don't use them, the studies would show that I'm going to leave them in my medicine cabinet. And curious teenagers that, as we all know, have kind of thrill-seeking behavior are somewhat prone to exploring those medicine cabinets to see what they have. I think the, the, the kind of a leading idea in the minds of teenagers is, well, street drugs, those are, for, those are for bad people, and those are dangerous. But pills, those are from a doctor. Those have to be safe. They can't be dangerous. And moving forward, Unfortunately, one of the things we begin to see is when addiction goes without treatment, it drives people to do some pretty unspeakable things. And one of which, coming back to unused medications in the medicine cabinet, is that people are not, um, not too shy, if you will, to steal from a random stranger's medicine cabinet. This is an article from CBS uh, regarding in Boston, people were going to open houses, not for the houses, but to raid the medicine cabinets for opioids and other prescription drugs, to the point that police were requiring people to store their prescription medications in special bags during the open house. And there's two things to take away from that. The first is, is unused medications in the home are a huge source of driving people's continued exposure to prescription painkillers and sometimes continuing to drive people's addiction. But the other thing is, Quite honestly, we should be able to have open houses in our country and not worry about people stealing our prescription drugs. We have to be able to move forward. Continued uh, on the same vein of kind of how bad things were getting and are getting, I've done training in my county for librarians on using Narcan or Naloxone, which is the uh, reversal agent for an opioid overdose. And it turns out that if you like to use opioids, you get kind of sleepy, a public library is a great place to use drugs. It's quiet. You can prop yourself up behind a book. And people don't think you're doing anything wrong. I don't know how you feel, but I feel that my nine-year-old child should have heroin-free or opiate-free libraries. Again, this kind of points to the fact that our nation's addiction and, and overuse of these medications is really creating some very unusual, difficult, and kind of morally disturbing circumstances. And we can do a better job of treating that. This is a chart looking at drugs involved in U.S. overdose deaths from 1999 to 2017. 
And you can see that heroin is rising sharply. That's the olive line. Opioids, natural and semi-synthetic, is on the rise. That's the kind of forest green line. And then synthetic opioids, like fentanyl, the blue line, are rising sharply. And as we talked about, why this matters is we're just trying to save American lives. When a person dies of an overdose, they cannot receive any further treatment. So for our county, there are a lot of historical moments that came through as an emergency provider. You're seeing things that happen. You're on the front lines of witnessing patients and families and their suffering. But it started to hit the national news. And as you can see on the lower left side, that's an image that's been pretty well shared across uh, the internet, and it's basically a family who has passed out from um, opiate use while they were driving. The horrifying part of that photo, besides the obvious, is that in that back corner, there's a toddler in a car seat. And living in a community and being part of our society, I felt as an emergency provider that we had to do something about this situation. Another situation that was very well shared across national um, media was the upper right-hand corner photo where this is in a retail store. Um, that woman has passed out. Ultimately, it was determined it was from an opiate overdose. But the grayed out part of the photo is her toddler standing over her crying and screaming for her mother. And I realized as an ER doc and as well as just part of a community that we had to do something about this. At first, there was the thought of, well, we're in a small community. It's not that big of a deal. It's someone else's problem. Well, it isn't. The left lower photo in this slide is our case. This is my kid, not my personal child, but I consider him um, someone that changed my life. This was a 19-month-old that came into our emergency department. He was my patient, and he died of an opiate overdose. Um, that changed the trajectory of prescribed safe. That day made a difference for all of us to realize that someone's so young, there's, there's no one that is not at risk from this epidemic. In the upper right corner is one of our local teenagers explaining on the news, yeah, I see pills at school every day. Almost like it's as normal as finding a pencil on the floor. Things like that are just unacceptable in any community, and so ours decided to make a change. And so, as I like to say, from the ashes arose prescribed safe. And I will give credit where credit is due. This was really Dr. Close, um, her brainchild, in saying, I, I can't watch young people my age suffering from addiction and, and, and untreated pain and watching them overdose. And I can't watch a 19-month-old child die in, or near die in my ER. We have to do something. And so um, a big part of this, and I will defer to Dr. Close for her comments on this, but is really collaboration. And, and I said before, it takes a village. Um, it has been such a collaborative organization in that we work with so many different facets of the people that are affected and can affect in return the opioid epidemic, and that's really been our success, and we'll talk about a lot of these alliances. Yeah, and a big part of this, and I've explained it a lot, is there, there's really no one who's spared in some way or another. There's no group. There's no family member. There's there's no one in our society that isn't affected. And so truly, when we were trying to figure out what we were going to do in response, I cold called a number of these agencies. And Dr. Chavez is one of our founding members as well. He made some phone calls. And we just asked, um, do you want to be part of this effort? Do you think you have something to contribute? And the universal answer was always yes. And subsequently, so when we started, this slide had far fewer involved parties. And as we moved along, each relationship started to grow new relationships. People asked me, reached out to the dentist. What about the pharmacist? What about the recovery service communities that are available in our area? Everyone we called, everyone we've worked with has wanted to participate and make a difference. So our initial goals were, as you see here, um, we sat down and had a bit of a strategic planning meeting. And we basically said, we need to improve the safety of prescription drugs. We want to avoid overprescribing or inappropriate prescribing. A big part of this is increasing access to treatment for addiction. Once a, per excuse me, once a person has gotten dependent on or addicted to prescription medications, we have to treat them. 
And then lastly is we needed to work on educating both the public and our local medical community on how we can do things better. And our first stop was the doctors at our own hospital. Um, our hospital within Montage Health is called Community Hospital of the Monterey Peninsula, or CHOMP. Um, so if you hear CHOMP, that's what we're referring to. And so this is from our local paper, the Monterey Herald. These are two of our hospitalists, and actually that's Dr. Close in the background, half cut off. But we literally have educational programs for our doctors. Let's register the doctors for prescription drug monitoring programs. Let's educate our nurses on how to better assess pain. Let's educate our physical therapists on ways to avoid using opioids. We really started with educating internally because we were able to, as an organization, decide that safe pain management was a goal. And kudos to our senior hospital leadership for our, supporting, our support in this initial effort. Moving forward, we needed to educate patients. Uh, I started at our hospital, CHOMP, in 2013. And when I started at CHOMP, it was common practice when someone sprained an ankle to give them 30 hydrocodone and a pat on the back to wish them good luck. And we didn't tell people. Opioids can be habit forming. We needed to educate people. And Dr. Close and I presented at Rotary Clubs and you know community-based organizations. And I'd have to say probably every other presentation, someone comes up to me and said, either me or my wife or my brother had surgery and no one told them those painkillers were habit forming. I wish someone had told me. Thus, we wrote a handout called The Hazards of Opioids, which goes through several common hazards that people deserve to know about, just as much as you need to know about the fact that, you know, a blood pressure medicine can make you feel weak and tired. Additionally, this was with um, collaboration from a physician in San Diego, Dr. Ronnie Lev, who's been a leader in the state of California. Um, on safe prescribing, and also with the help of the California chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, but we needed to give people guidelines. And I think that really helps providers who want to say yes to patients and want to please patients to say, sir, I understand you'd like me to refill your morphine, but the guidelines tell me not to and I don't think it's safe. And so this is a copy of one of our handouts to give to patients in the emergency department to say, these are what we can do safely, these are what we can't do safely, and these are all the organizations that support this. And it's been really helpful. And the other thing you can see at the bottom is, if you need help with substance abuse or addiction, please call. We really want to help people get into treatment. We also have a very robust website um, our communications and marketing department at Montage Health is incredible. They tell me every day I'm not a graphic designer, and they're <laughs> right. They make beautiful websites for us, and they're awesome. And so if you Google Montage Prescribed Safe or Chomp Prescribed Safe, we have a wonderful website, and it's broken down information for patients, information for families, information for doctors, information for pharmacists. We really try to make it easy to get. And the whole point of this is that if you're in Kentucky and you see something you like, it shouldn't be hard to get that. Steal it, reuse it, rebrand it. If it helps patients, that's the goal. And in California, we've been doing that. We work closely with Marin County, Santa Cruz County, Alameda County, Ventura County, San Diego County, the list goes on. And we share stuff back and forth. Hey, did you see San Diego set that great handout? Awesome. Let's steal it from Monterey County. And really the best kind of way I can describe this process is if someone's got something good, let's make it accessible to providers easily, and let's make it accessible to patients easily. Additionally, we also want to encourage rational, safe, and accessible treatment for pain. Um, these are, in our community, five trusted pain management clinics. These are people to whom I would send my mother, uh, I think between Dr. Close and I, we've actually seen one or two of them ourselves, and we've really tried to make good pain management a cornerstone of our organization. Because for years we tell our physicians, please don't prescribe opioids, and they look at us like, well, then what do we do? And we've really tried to make that a cornerstone of as you move away from opioids, what else is available. So down on the lower left, Salar Delbar is a fantastic pain management doctor. I refer patients from the ER to him with a pinched nerve in their neck or their back, 
He gets them in for uh, um, an epidural. On the upper right, Dr. Krupp has been wonderful. Same thing, we can get uh, patients referred to her for epidural management. They do prescribing. On the upper left, Monterey Spine and Joint. I'm a patient at that clinic for various orthopedic injuries. The pain management guys are awesome. They're very progressive. We really just want to give people the option to get good pain management. And also some of these physicians are willing to take people on opioids, work to treat their pain, and taper them off opioids, which is huge. The next thing um, we realized is that Dr. Close and I are both allopathic physicians. We're MDs. But there's so much out there that provides pain relief that doesn't involve an MD. So we just started asking our colleagues, hey, who do you go to? What do you consider when you've got pain? Hey, do you have any good practitioners? And we created a list of complementary and alternative providers that we use. And I can say personally, I tore my labrum in my left shoulder. And between acupuncture and physical therapy, I was able to avoid surgery. Um, we've also both seen chiropractors. And another thing we also learned is that most physicians, nurses, physical therapists, kind of the traditional medical specialties, don't really understand kind of who does what and how to get people into things. One of our local uh, colleagues who runs kind of a physician group for Monterey County, Dr. Jim Gilbert, put us in contact with people to learn from them. Hey, let's sit down with a chiropractor. You know, Dr. Cater, what do you do as a chiropractor? Dr. Liu, what do you do as an acupuncturist? How can we make this information easily digestible, easily accessible, and available so that when, you know, someone's in the ER and they've got really bad pain, we can give them hope of, sir, I think your type of pain might respond to an acupuncturist. And kudos to our local Medicaid provider, the Central California Alliance for Health, They've authorized Medicaid patients to get up to two chiropractor acupuncture visits per month. And that's been huge for really everybody having access to these types of therapies. And what's incredible is we're just scratching the surface. We've discovered gyrotonic. We've discovered cryotherapy. We've discovered neural EEG feedback. There's so much out there. I'm going to circle us back to that medicine cabinet. I know we're all very familiar, and in fact, if you look at your own or your family members, you would see medications that even if they're not sedating medicines, such as opiates or, or benzodiazepines or medications that we've been discussing in that regard, I don't think necessarily leftover blood pressure medicines are safe, leftover antibiotics. I believe most people at this point are now familiar with pill parties, where um, typically teenagers will take medications from the home medicine cabinet without any idea of what their function or risks are. They take them to a party, they drop them all in a bowl, and you just take a handful. You may end up with an opiate, and so therefore you get high, and that was the goal, or you may end up with a blood thinner, which I don't believe is necessarily the goal. But they don't know, and unfortunately this is a huge risk. So initially when we started our work, there weren't a lot of options for drug take-backs, Certainly, the uh, U.S. Department of Justice came up with something wonderful that we tapped into immediately, and that was their national drug take back. So we asked our um, communications and marketing group, which we've already expressed how wonderful they've been, and they helped us advertise this. And we went to the event. Our local media was there and really sponsored um, normalizing that just bring your medicines here. Drop them off. Thanks for coming by. And I think that made a big difference for people feeling comfortable instead of, uh-oh, I, I have these, what, what do I do? And that was the first thing that we started to do to get rid of medications that were no longer needed and get them out of our community. While we were using that, we started to come up with permanent solutions. And so we were able to, with um, some grant funding that we received, we were able to get permanent medication bins and now a sharp bin, sharp bin at our own hospital and then at various, states, various areas throughout our county. Um, down in South County, we're reaching out into North County. Basically, anywhere that wants to sponsor a bin and is able to, we'll put one there. And the point is of making it so accessible and so easy for people to do the right thing, which is to get these medications safely disposed of. You know, the whole kitty litter in the trash, I'd much prefer that these are safely incinerated where there is no residual that gets into our water. Um, or into the hands of our pets or our family members. 
And uh, uh, our, our, I think our next segue here is that as we connect you with some of the police departments that have hosted bins, we've really realized how important law enforcement is in, in all of this. On the lower right, this is a photo um, with one of the police officers at the very south end of our county in the city of King City. And this is Dr. Close and myself posing with their drug bin. And what's incredible is the police have been knowing about this for years, and they've been working to address drug diversion and drug addiction for years, and they were so ready to partner with healthcare providers. Um, in our county, our hospital partners with our in-city police department, Monterey City Police Department, to work on collaborating with individuals that are at risk for addiction, overdose, homelessness. And we've also partnered with most of the law enforcement agencies in our county as far as us providing education to them on drug diversion, the drug schedules, how prescriptions get forged. They in turn tell us what information they need when we're reporting a drug diversion case. In the upper left, we in Monterey County through grant funding through private healthcare insurance companies, have a deputy district attorney for healthcare fraud. And the photo of the woman in the upper left is Amy Patterson, who I think I can safely describe as a firecracker. Amy has been absolutely instrumental in getting us together with law enforcement, introducing us to Department of Healthcare Services investigators, introducing us to the Department of Pharmacy, partnering with law enforcement and county district attorney's office has been so powerful in understanding all of the different facets of how the criminal justice system works. And most importantly, I think it empowers us as providers to want to report crimes, not because we're, quote, getting bad guys, but if someone's addicted, they can get court-ordered drug treatment, and they may not get treatment for addiction any other way. There was a young man in our emergency department who was borrowing his friend's Medicaid ID to get IV morphine. And we confronted him on it and ultimately reported him to law enforcement. And Amy Patterson herself tried his case and got him nine months of court-ordered drug treatment for his opiate dependence. And that, in my mind, is where the system works. Healthcare providers, law enforcement, the district attorney's office, drug treatment, all coming together. I don't think any talk about the opiate epidemic at this point could be completed with, without a discussion about naloxone. Um, this is a brand of naloxone called Narcan, specifically the nasal spray, and this is currently being widely disseminated throughout California by a grant from the Department of Healthcare Services in California. And what I can tell you is basically naloxone saves lives, period. If somebody is having an opioid overdose, even a mixed overdose like alcohol and opioids or benzodiazepines and opioids, naloxone can save their life and liberally providing this to the community is life-saving. And let me give you some of the naysay we get about naloxone. People tell me, oh, I don't want to give naloxone to somebody. They're just going to use opioids irresponsibly. Or, oh, I don't want to give naloxone to somebody because then they'll just overdose for fun and use the naloxone to get them back. Okay, that's fine. I have four fire extinguishers in my home. I'm going to get rid of my fire extinguishers because I'm a safe homeowner or I have to drive to the hospital later today, I'm just not going to wear my seatbelt because I'm a good driver. Naloxone is like a seatbelt. We prescribe it to people to prevent a potentially life-destroying event, and if it doesn't get used, so be it. Additionally, the studies would also show, last time I checked, that when you're dead, you cannot receive treatment for addiction. And what I mean by that, and forgive my sarcasm, is that, yes, I understand people may believe that people are abusing naloxone by pushing the limits on how much they can use drugs. But if they die, we never get a chance to get them into treatment. And if you remember my friend Paul, he's the one that painted the photo. He's received naloxone himself more than once. And he is given an opportunity to get into treatment every time he is rescued from an overdose. They call it recovery when you get treated for addiction because you get your life back. And that's a big part of what this medication is all about. In our community, we have armed our law enforcement with naloxone. And this is a news article when Seaside Police, which is the one city over from Monterey, rescued a person from an overdose at Jack in the Box in the, the city of Seaside. That is a person who gets a chance 
to get treatment. And I don't care how they started, whether they got started legitimately because they got knee surgery and ended up on opioids, whether they were abused by their family and used opiates to numb the emotional pain they had and ended up on heroin. It doesn't matter. When they are given the naloxone, they get a chance to get treatment. And we are really trying in our emergency department, when there's an overdose, we get social work, we get our, um, our communities involved, want to take that as an opportunity to get people into treatment. And law enforcement has been hugely on board. I believe we've had over 11 saves in about 18 months since we started, and our county has around 440,000 residents in it. Moving forward, we're going to talk about some practical ways to improve safe pain management uh, for healthcare providers. So the first thing is that healthcare providers are busy, and the easy thing is usually what gets done. It's trying to hang a dose of antibiotics that takes a certain amount of time. If there's a shortcut, you bet I'm going to take it because I've got to hang another dose of antibiotics for my next patient. For me as a prescriber, if I can give you a prescription, I want to do what's fastest so I can expediently move on to my next patient. Writing out by hand ibuprofen is approximately the same number of letters as oxycodone. So pre-printed non-opioid prescriptions were a really intelligent way to be able to make it faster to write for safe non-opioid medications. This is from our emergency department. Check Flexeril. Check Lidoderm. Check Volterin. With three strikes of my pen, I can write for three non-opioid pain relievers. Additionally, certain types of providers literally inflict pain upon their patients. Um, I recently had a very serious hand uh, injury and required hand surgery. And the hand surgeon had to open up my hand, make additional trauma to my injury to fix me. And you bet my hand hurt. And as a part of that, when you talk to dentists and when you talk to surgeons, they will say, we cause pain as we help people to heal. We don't want to undertreat people. And so there are ways that are better than just prescribing everybody 60 pain tablets. Um, for example, depending on the type of medication, you can write for 15 pain tablets with three refills. That's still 60 tablets, and that's maybe too big of a dose, but you're only giving out 15 tablets at a time. And you can actually then, like Dr. Close mentioned, reduce the amount of medication that stays in the medicine cabinet at any time. Additionally, as we put on this humorous example of Dr. Robert Weir writing for patient Jerry Garcia, you can write for stronger medications, like Schedule II medications, a dated prescription. Write them a week of medications. Write, this, write them a second prescription for another week dated one week later. The patient only goes home with 15 tablets but they still have access if they need more. And on this line, we learned this from one of our prescribers who takes care of patients that are at very high risk for overdose. And what he will literally do is he will write or have his office staff assist him in writing enough prescriptions that he gives the patient one per day. There are patients that he's that concerned about, he'll have his staff write, fill on 9-1 fill on 9-2, fill on 9-3, and he signs them, that is his method of keeping someone as safe as is ever possible to do. And we share that with our other providers who are concerned. They're afraid that the patient will need 30 tablets, but they're afraid if they get 30, they'll take them off. And so they will write a week at a time or a few days at a time just to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect our patients and their safety. Absolutely. One other thing we've learned uh, Dr. Close and I are both emergency physicians, so we don't perform surgery. But if someone's admitted after surgery, you get a little observation period to see how much pain they have. So let's say, for example, someone has a C-section, and they require one opioid tablet in two days after their C-section. They're not likely going to need 30 tablets to go home if they only took one tablet in 48 hours. However, on the flip side, if someone's having a lot of pain and is requiring pain tablets, every four hours, that person's going to need a large prescription. So nursing staff can be empowered to kind of keep tabs on their patients and make educated recommendations to prescribers on what they actually think a person might need based on pain control inside the hospital. The last thing we'll talk about with inpatient um, hospital pain management is if you give people good options, 
they will use them. The example I give is I was lecturing at a hospital in the Bay Area, and I was talking about some of the stuff we're doing at Montage Health, and uh, he says, Doc, dude, that's crazy, man. Like in our hospital, all we have is Tylenol and Motrin and morphine. There's really nothing else. So kind of that they fail Tylenol or in the wrong Coumadin, all we have is morphine. And there's so many other options. We worked with our pharmacy department, who, by the way, has been a huge supporter and so helpful in developing sensible medications regimens for us. But with our pharmacy department, we developed a pain management order set for our hospital. And it's got something like 45 medications on it, most of which are not opioids. We started to use things like IV lidocaine for kidney stones or IV lidocaine postoperatively. We've used IV ketamine. Um, uh, you know, we've recommended to patients and given to patients in our emergency department topical non-opioid medications like Lidoderm, which is a topical lidocaine preparation, or Volterra, a topical NSAID. We're starting to use nerve blocks. We have a couple really facile physicians that when a patient breaks their hip rather than giving them morphine, puts bupivacaine in their femoral nerve to be able to treat their pain at the source. And sometimes it also takes a little bit of an extra understanding to understand that not all pain is the same. And we've also begun to use TENS units. On the top, if you're interested, uh, this is a, um, a study on the National Library of Medicine where we literally tried to use TENS units in our ER to see if it would work. And the answer is resoundingly yes. A TENS unit is a small reusable device it uses a, a low-dose electrical current to basically distract away the pain. And over time, its recurrent use can actually reduce chronic pain. And we give these out in the emergency department all the time. Um, and uh, one of our pharmacists who works with palliative medicine has worked to expand this to our, our palliative medicine service, particularly our oncology patients as well. Yeah, we've been incredibly encouraged by what we see from the staff, from the patients, from the families, from the providers as feedback about how well this works. The nurses actually in our department is what pushed this forward as quickly as it went because they were realizing, gosh, I can go to the bedside and give them so much morphine for this pain syndrome that I'm concerned about their respiratory effort and their ability to breathe, or I can put on a TENS unit and come back in 20 minutes and they're on their iPhone chatting with their family and talking about how comfortable they are. It's been tremendous. Absolutely. So initially when we started, um, we were a tiny little group. We expanded in 2017, and we have a number of our, our members and many of our founding members are in this photo. We have our Sheriff's Coroner's Office is representative. We have um, representation from all of the hospitals in our area, as well as from our public health department, our Medi-Cal, um, our behavioral health department. And then the next time, which was um, just a few weeks ago, we keep growing. We have our, our dental society is now represented. Pharmacists are now well represented. Drug treatment programs. Our treatment programs have been an amazing part that we really started adding in to our foundation of effort. And we continue to grow and expand with the work that we're doing. And I think the kind of the take home that, that I have learned from these meetings is when you get everybody in the room, you learn. And what I mean by that is the DA's office has one perspective. The drug treatment program has another perspective. A retail pharmacist has another perspective. A county clinic medical director has another perspective. And to put all these perspectives in the room, and we usually book them about six months in advance to give everybody a chance to get it on their schedule, is we are able to move so much forward as a collaborative effort when everybody provides their unique perspective. Circling back to how we educate and how we open the lines of communication, we have started alerting our physicians of patients of theirs that have either suffered a non-fatal overdose from our emergency department or a fatal overdose from our coroner's office. And I have to say, these letters are hard for some doctors to receive. Oh, yeah. Um, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of concern, a lot of, of wondering if they are, quote, to blame. And the important thing about the letter is its communication. And so we let them know, this patient is at risk. We hope that you're able to reach out. If we can help with anything as far as resources or, or ideas, please reach out. 
and the overwhelming response has been positive. Um, a lot of good work has come from these notifications. I, I will mention that our OBGYN colleagues and our pediatricians have been receiving these and they've had no idea that their patient was at risk. And those conversations are tremendous. When the doctors call and they, they speak to me, typically I field all of these calls and they'll ask me, you know, what, what is happening? Well, how is this person in trouble? And I'll share with them the overdose information from the ER and they reach out to that patient and try to affect the change before, honestly, they end up on what we call our coroner's list after it's too late. And if they do have a patient on a coroner's list, we have seen many changes that prescribers realize of how, what we can do to try to do anything to make things safer for our patients and community. This is a big topic, so I think we'll try to be brief on this particular topic. But Really, um, the point of this slide is to highlight that treating addiction is a huge part of this. And buprenorphine is an incredible medication to help with stabilization of opiate dependence, opiate withdrawal, and opiate, with, opiate addiction. Um, you could do an hour lecture on just buprenorphine and suboxone. But really, the point is, is that when people are addicted for years, we told them they were bad people. We didn't offer treatment and then we wonder why they couldn't get sober. And a big part of what we can do as a community and as a nation is increase, increase access to treatments for addiction. So when people are in crisis, they are received by welcoming healthcare providers who can help them and get them into treatment. Because again, they call it recovery as treatment for addiction because you get your life back. And in our emergency department, if someone comes in an opiate withdrawal with opiate dependence, we are giving them buprenorphine, sometimes in the form of suboxone, and getting them follow-up and treatment. The last point we'll make, and then we'll wrap up with a few of our successes, is to talk about schools. And um, I will, I'll, I'll embarrass Dr. Close here because this is her elementary school in Utah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, but I've been going to local high schools and just talking with kids. And kids are aware. They see the social media, they see their friends, they know what's happening. And I usually target freshmen, because I think they're pretty close to around the point that it, they may have started dabbling or are considering it. And then also considering seniors, because they've had an ability to already see bad choices happen, and they're off to a world where they'll have a lot less oversight. And I've reached out to probably four or five of the high schools in our community and had a really positive response. And I've seen some of the kids in the ER afterwards when, uh, when they've gotten injured, they're like, hey, doc, you're that drug guy. Thanks for coming to our class. So um, it, it's been really effective, and we look to continue this. All right, so we'll, we'll move forward with a couple of statistics to show our successes, and then we look forward to being able to have some question and answer to discuss other issues that folks have, and, and again, try to collaborate and promote stealing of whatever you think would work for your collaboration. So the first thing is, this is from one of our local urgent care, a primary care clinic called Doctors on Duty. This is their prescribing of scheduled pills from 2014 to 2018. And you can see just a very steady downward trend. And that's been a, a wonderful success as they have a huge impact taking care of a number of the patients in our community. This is our local Medicaid provider in California that's called Medi-Cal. And our local Medicaid is called the Central California Alliance for Health. And this represents um, a 50% decrease trending over the last several years, um, uh, as I mentioned, a 50% decrease in the number of opioid prescriptions filled by patients on Medicaid in our community. Um, and kudos to our local Medicaid, the Central California Alliance for Health, for their progressive work in authorizing non-opioid medications and encouraging providers to avoid high-dose opioid regimens. This is data from our own emergency department to show that Physician education does work. This is looking at the use of non-opioid medications from 2012 to 2014 to 2014 to 2016. And you can see that our use of non-opioid medications has increased from anywhere from about 150 to over 300%. And we've been really proud of our ability to manage pain without opioids. I mean, I'm trying to think. I haven't given a person with a migraine opioid oh, in probably over six months, probably even over 12 months. Yeah, I was going to say it's a long time. And this is uh, one of the most exciting slides of the presentation. This shows um, all of California's counties listed from highest overdose death rate 
to lower do lowest overdose death rate in 2012. And the, the red arrow on the left side represents Monterey. The red bar represents California. So here was Monterey in 2012. And moving forward, here was Monterey in 2017. Yeah, and we truly are watching this happen in our own community, and it's been tremendous um, to be able to follow. And seeing it graphically, this is a representation, representation of the overdose deaths in Monterey County as compared to the California state average. Monterey's in blue, California state average in orange. And you can see that Monterey's just had a plummeting overdose death rate. Absolutely. And if you compare to some of our neighbors, unfortunately, and I don't have any of the etiologies behind these differences, but our county is really making a huge difference. And I'm incredibly proud of the work that we do. We're also reaching out to other counties, and exactly as we're doing today, here's our information. Please take anything that you find helpful. Please reach out if you have any questions. If our success can be shared, let's take that whole California bar and then our national bar and drop that. And on that note, I think we'll move forward with some questions. And then, Kevin, if you want to add anything from your perspective on kind of the high-level administrative side, we appreciate your input. Yeah, I'll just take five seconds uh, to share that uh, we at the foundation here thought it was uh, critically important to engage in this work and to help uh, the two doctors in the community not only spread the word but support it financially. And so um, we've contributed about a quarter million dollars uh, over the last several years. Um, and in order to help uh, broaden the scope of the education and, and the imprint uh, within the county, uh, a lot of that came from uh, drives that we did with hospital employees, and we've had hundreds and hundreds of hospital employees uh, contribute uh, out of their paychecks in order to support this program. And then as a result, we've been able to purchase the TENS units that the doctors talked about. Uh, we've put Narcan into every police vehicle in Monterey County and, and uh, paid for the um, uh, opioid detection units and the return bins and all these things. Um, and so in the category of it takes a village, uh, part of that village has to be somebody that can actually fund it. And so we feel proud to be able to uh, be underwriting these efforts. Um, and that's all I'll say about that. And we'll turn it over uh, to answer the questions that are popping up. Just one brief point to follow Kevin. The foundation has been incredible. And in the last probably two years to three years, with the foundation support, our ability to get creative and reach out from our hospital to the community has skyrocketed. But when we started, our funding was very minimal, and it was honestly just education, handouts, and connecting with community-based organizations. And the, and the highlight I'll make here is that you can do it on basically any budget, meaning if you want to steal our handouts and start with physician and patient education through handouts, that's a low-budget start. And again, with Kevin and the foundation support, we've been able to really increase our outreach. Um, and again, we're very grateful for that. Thank you so much, Kevin, Rev, and Casey. So we have some great questions coming in. One is um, from Tony. We'll be speaking to local 7th through 12th graders next week on the opioid epidemic. What are areas you feel are best to cover with them. So this is Casey. I'll take this one on. So when I was growing up, it was just say no, and it was dare. And unfortunately, we found that those didn't work. And the way I present things to kids is I tell them, look, I know you're smart. I'm going to tell you what addiction looks like, and you tell me if you think drug use sounds like a good idea. And the point I usually try to highlight is that addiction is essentially a disease of decision making. And what I mean by that is the brain with repeated drug use basically restructures itself that rather than love, food, or shelter, the drug is the only priority. People are willing when their brain is dealing with addiction to rob siblings, rob grandmothers, try to give themselves infections to get into drug trials. People do horrible stuff. So I don't really try to scare the kids, but I just say, look, this is what I see in the ER. I'm going to give you the facts. You make a decision. Because I think a lot of these kids think, like, whatever. I'm smart. I can use and not get in trouble. I would never do something bad. 
I'm too smart for that. Highlight that sentiment of you're smart. Let me give you the facts. Like if you're going to buy something on Amazon, you're going to see how many stars it gets. I'm going to give you the facts. You tell me how many stars using drugs gets. And the next question, thank you, Casey. The next question is a clinical care question. How common is use of buprenorphine induction in your ED? Um, is that a common practice in, in your area? So this is a this is Reb. This is a really interesting um, way that things have worked for us. Many years ago, we had an ER provider who also has been addiction trained. And so when I came to Monterey in 2003, we were already using buprenorphine in the ER. It was very common. Um, someone would come in and withdrawal, we'd give them a dose of buprenorphine, we'd get them out of withdrawal, we'd send them over to our addiction doc, and it was easy to go. So unfortunately, there was an insurance change. We got kind of stuck in the rigmarole that many people were getting stuck into. And then fortunately, someone in California decided he was going to make it different, and that was Dr. Andrew Herring. He's up at Oakland and Highlands. And he has pioneered the efforts for bringing, we call it BUP is back, bringing BUP back to the ER. And he's normalized it. And fortunately, and again, this is part of my work with California American College of Emergency Physicians, they normalized it. So they made guidelines. They brought it into, you're not just these rogue doctors that have this rogue situation where you can prescribe buprenorphine and get patients started on recovery in the ER. This is the guideline. And this is our organization saying it's okay, and this is how it's done. And so we've normalized it so much that I started someone on buprenorphine during my shift yesterday. That's just what we do. It's as much as you would start an antibiotic if it were appropriate. In the right situation, we absolutely start it, and we have used actually a telemedicine bridge because of insurance issues that I'll be honest, I would probably never understand. Um, but we've used a telemedicine bridge to help any single person that comes in the ER and would like treatment for opiate addiction and wants to start buprenorphine, I can get it for them and I can get them a plan for follow-up. To answer your question very specifically about how common is it, right now in our county we have four hospitals. We are doing it regularly. One is building a program and the other two um, are addressing other issues that they have. Um, and so it really varies. Um, I don't think in any way, shape, or form it's out of the scope of practice of an emergency physician to be able to prescribe buprenorphine and to induce. But the one thing that really should happen before an emergency department starts is they have to have somewhere to send patients. And there's a number of large grants going through California right now to, uh, to be able to increase access to landing sites. If you think about it, if you come into my ER in withdrawal and I stabilize you on buprenorphine, that's great. But if you don't have anywhere to go, we've kind of missed the mark. Not that we shouldn't do what's right to treat you, but then you end up having to go out of county or you end up coming back to the ER. So really as we build, we have to build stabilization in the emergency department. And we also have to build a place for them to go as they continue. And one of the things that we've really found that helps enormously in doing this is involvement of social work in the emergency department. We have several social workers in our emergency department that are absolutely exceptional in finding ways to make the system work for patients. And then as a doctor, it's really easy. Like, hey, you're in withdrawal. Let me write you a script. No problem. And then my social worker is going to get you set up. Thank you. And a, a community question from Kate. How can people give support to prescribe safe and the Montage Foundation so that we can grow as a community, a county, and, and we'd love for you to also weigh in on, again, some of what you have already talked about um, in terms of encouraging this movement and momentum to spread elsewhere. Absolutely. I think I'll start with the fact that everybody has a story. And everybody has an experience or many experiences with healthcare. And all of that shapes how we perceive our healthcare world. Um, I mentioned I had a hand injury. I'm in a freak accident. My front door just shattered and lacerated my hand, and I had to have hand surgery. I now have a new perspective on healthcare, having sat there and had my hand operated upon. And what I mean by that is patients with chronic pain suffer. 
but yet they often are silent or feel like they're disenfranchised, like nobody wants to take care of him, a chronic pain patient. Those people should share their experiences, come together as a community, and advocate for their support in our community. We are very grateful in our institution and in our county to have a chronic pain support group where people talk about their experiences and they build a community and they build kind of a momentum that I want to get better and I'm going to learn from people in my similar experiences to see how I can get better and then I'm going to share my experience so somebody who's never lived what I've lived can understand how we can make the whole system work better. So obviously a financial donation is very helpful. A specific financial donation with the goal to complete a project like I would like to help pledge a certain amount of money to see buprenorphine start in our emergency department. It also can be sometimes in the right setting just supporting the sharing of ideas like a town hall. Dr. Close and I have contributed to another, a, um, a number of town halls where parents ask, like, my kid's on Adderall. What does that mean? And you can see the other parents in the room nodding. It might be that, and as we're hoping to do in our community, we create an event like a recovery run where everybody does a run walk to celebrate recovery. It might be that we have an overdose, uh, what is that, a candlelit, um, candlelit vigil to understand how overdose ruins our lives. I think really the best thing is if you have a story, share it. If you have the resources to support a project, do so. And I think the most important thing is, is when someone's had an injury or someone is suffering or someone is addictive, offer them a hug, and be willing to support them as they get treatment. I have to say both Dr. Close and I have learned a lot from our patients as well as from being patients. Thank you so much. We're close to the end of the hour. I did, again, want to just heartily thank um, Reb, Casey, and Kevin for joining us today and sharing all of their insights and experiences with Prescribed Safe. Um, I also wanted you all to uh, check out AHA's website and, and let you know that coming in the future are some podcasts where each of them gets to do a deeper dive into some of the things discussed today, collaboration, what it's meant to prescribe safe funding, as well as complementary and alternative medicine and the role it plays. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's event. You may now disconnect your lines, log off the webinar. Have a great day.